and welcome again to the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series. My name is Gary Hurley of Fisherman's Post. Fisherman's Post that's been serving the fishing community since 2003, bringing the fishing community fishing reports, fishing information, fishing events, fishing tournaments, fishing schools, and now in our latest chapter, the Saltwater Podcast Series. In the Fisherman's Post Saltwater Podcast Series, we are talking to our friends, our captain and guide friends from up and down the North Carolina coast, getting their insights to help our viewers and listeners catch more fish more often. And we hope that with that confidence of catching more fish more often, it just gets you on the water more often, spending more time with more family, more friends, more water time. Um, I am well, happy to introduce this title. It will be Summertime Grouper. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus exclusively on Summertime Grouper. We're going to be talking to Captain Todd Skeen today of Shenanigans Sport Fishing. He's out of the Hampstead area. Um, our topic points will be such as drifting versus anchoring, where to fish, what to look for on the sonar, rigs and bait, and then how to feel the bite and fight the fish once you have the bite. So we've got a lot to cover. And again, it's grouper and only grouper. I'm joined as I am every week, every episode, by my co my co-host, Billy Thorpe of Thorpe Creative. How you doing, Billy? What's up, Gary? Doing good, man. Good, doing good. You're good. looking good. I think so, man. I've been doing stuff. <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Not working out, chasing a two-year-old. That's it. No working out. But yeah, you have that two-year-old glow about you. I, okay <laughs> i don't know what that means but i'll take it it means you look tired you look <laughs> sleep deprived looks like your wife isn't nice to you because <laughs> the baby you let him put the put the applesauce on the couch again <laughs> oh, i'm sorry honey <laughs> i've had way more sleep than she has by the way i put that out there in case she does she's not gonna listen to this She's but just listen. in case she does oh man speaking of listening to it gary i'm gonna let people know how to watch how to listen um here is a list of places you can watch and listen spotify podbean stitcher apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and youtube you can uh listen or watch on one of those platforms and the easiest way to find those is people go how the heck do i find them go to our website fishermanspost.com go to the podcast tab and there's a drop down watch and listen. So you can go on there and choose whichever way you want to watch, listen. It'll give you all the links, more about it, our Patreon account, all the good stuff is on that page. So, um, and all of this is made possible by our sponsors. As you can see, the logo, Marine Warehouse Center, right there in between us, Gary. And I got a little message from those guys, and we'll be right back. At Marine Warehouse, we have everything. We have new boats, we have parts, we have accessories, new trailers. We have a complete service department with highly trained technicians. Anything you need to get out on the water, we have. At Marine Warehouse Center, as we've grown over the last few years, now have a large section of marine supplies from start to finish for all your boating needs. What I love about this region is to be able to get out on the water, and also we love to be able to get you out on the water. The best part of working at Marine Warehouse is being able to get involved with the customers and share a love for the water. Boom. There it is. And they're great guys. They are, man. They're a lot of fun. A and lot of fun. And so here's my latest angle with Marine Warehouse Center, Billy. I know you've been trying to brainstorm a different approach. Yeah, a different angle. So a different angle. And, you know, I mean, I it's easy to talk about sales, service parts. They got a great team. It's a great team. Great company, great team. And so I want to talk more about the team players. All right. I'm and excited. so I'm going to introduce you to a couple of team players, you know, just one per episode. So today would be Robbie Diggs. Robbie Diggs is in sales. All right. All right. So I got a, I got a question for you. Okay. Which I'm going to give you two choices. Which does Emmett, Emmett being the owner, which does Emmett make fun of more when it comes to Robbie Diggs, right? That's a great <laughs> setup. Does Emmett make more fun of the fact that, Robbie chose to get a seagull tattoo <laughs> or does Emmett make more fun that Robbie took time off of work to get the seagull tattoo? Uh, I'm going to go with option B more fun because he took time it off took of time work off to get a seagull tattoo. Um, I, I probably just work some over both. I don't really have an answer, but he does have a seagull tattoo, but apparently he does have a seagull <laughs> tattoo. <laughs> And that is oh, man. worthy of make. I mean, if you get a seagull tattoo, I mean, I and get you it. work at Marine Warehouse. I, yeah, you got to think these guys are going to let me have it. So what do you do? 
you take time off of work to get the seagull <laughs> tattoo just to make sure you give him plenty of material. Very, I mean, it's strategic. Robbie is strategic. Poor guy, man. I bet he's not ever living that down. We won't talk about tattoos, but I mean, I had one that was pretty funny at one time, and I got it fixed because I – never mind. I won't go into it, but I won't make too much fun of Robbie, that's for sure. All right. Show me a photo. All right, here we go. Talking about grouper, and look at this grouper, Jesse Savage. He is a savage with a gag grouper caught on a, some ledges 30 miles out of Masonboro Inlet in 90 feet of water. He was using a barefoot jig setup. We or a barefoot. A barefoot jig setup. I think we spelled it. Did we spell it barefoot? We didn't spell. I mean. I copy and pasted. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. Uh, I put that. I, was, I thought it was said barefoot. And I'm like, I don't even know. So I'm just going to leave it in there. I'm going to check. There we go. Fisherman's Post. I caught Gary Hurley, ladies and gentlemen. It's Damn on the it. record. Damn it. <laughs> Billy. What? <laughs> Here's what I want you to direct your attention now. I know how to spell barefoot if that's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> when I'm talking to Captain Todd Skeen, what I want you to do is I want you to pay attention. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to come to you for Billy's All best right. takeaway. The best piece of advice you think you gleaned from Todd's talk about summertime grouper. All right. I'm excited, man. Right, pay it's attention. Good show. All right. Captain Todd Skeen, welcome to the show. Captain Todd Skeen of Shenanigans Sport Fishing out of the Hampstead area. We are going to be talking summertime grouper, drifting versus anchoring, where to fish, what to look for on sonar, rigs and bait, and how to feel the bite and fight the fish. Welcome to the show, Captain Todd Skeen. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Captain Todd, before we move forward, we have a little, we like to vet our talent, like not like we didn't do it before this, but we're headed to my standard question. You know, we're getting ready to talk to you for about a half an hour or so. So the question is, why should my podcast listeners and viewers listen to what you have to say about a grouper? Uh, that's a tough one. I would say... I catch a good number of them, although I certainly don't have all the answers. I've got a few of the answers, and things I can talk to you about and show you out on a charter can help you put those fish in the boat pretty consistently. So if I call you and want to go king mackerel fishing, what's the answer? Not on my boat. Go grouper fishing. <laughs> <laughs> we can drive around and uh, put a light line out while we're catching grouper, but I'm not targeting kings, no. I, lo I mean, I love that about, I just wanted to get that out early in the show. I love that about you, that you target grouper, grouper, and more grouper. And if you have another interest, that's great. But to go back to the list, you target grouper, grouper, and more grouper. Everything we do is target grouper, and <laughs> anything besides the grouper is bycatch. Now, some of that bycatch is quite tasty or fun to catch, but it's bycatch. It's grouper, grouper, and grouper. That's what we're after every single trip. Man, I love it. So here we go. We have one other feature on this podcast. It's called the two questions where I ask you two questions that aren't necessarily related to the topic. However, in your case, I do have two questions that are related to the topic. I didn't okay. do the, not, the traditional non-fishing question. When we're talking about grouper, species of grouper, do you know how the Jewfish got its name? Uh, no, I don't. I had to Google it, so I'll, I'll own that right up the bat. Some believe... It was this species of grouper that swallowed Jonah, the Jewish prophet of the Old Testament. Who, who would have thunk it? I have another question for you. <laughs> when I'm out there grouper fishing, you hear certain sayings. I could only recall two in the time I gave this thought right before this podcast. I'm going to give you two sayings I've heard out there grouper fishing. You tell me which you put more credence in, okay? All right. Statement number one that I hear out there where I'm grouper fishing. Even elephants eat peanuts. Statement number two, where there's grunt, there's grouper. Mm. They're both true to an extent. I guess that I put more credence in the second one where there's grunt, there's grouper, especially if they're nice size grunt, not little ones. All right. Well, man, we've moved successfully through the two questions feature. Let's go to the primary content. And I, I like where you want to start because I think this is a question many people have, drifting versus anchoring. Ooh, do I not get a chance to ask you guys questions? Oh, wait. Yeah, come on. <laughs> well, I mean, if you, turnabout's fair play. 100%. Okay. Who wants to go first? I'll do one for each of you. How's that? Um, me first, please. Okay. You mentioned tattoos. 
<laughs> Billy has a tattoo on his left forearm. What is it of? I didn't even know he had a tattoo that on his is, left forearm. That's a great question, man. It's not a seagull because that would have come out in the banner in the beginning of the show. <laughs> I'm going to say it is something religious related. It is. Good job, Gary. That's as close as I can get, though. A okay. cross. No, it's not a cross. Okay. But it is religious related. Or not. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Good job. Good, Good job. Uh, the next one is for Billy. I hope Gary doesn't have a tattoo because I can't see any. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Billy, yours is just going to be true false because I, I know you got a two-year-old and you're not getting as much sleep as you want. you got a 50-50 chance here. I appreciate that. True false. In episode two of your podcast <laughs> with Rick Croson. Gary wore his shirt inside out. Huh. That sounds true. It's but- absolutely true. <laughs> Go back and watch it. Your I t- did not know that. Your Ooh. t-shirt's inside out, man. What a catch. <laughs> he's not only going to catch him grouper, he's going to catch him production stuff. My eight-year-old is so proud of me right now. That is one thing we share in common is the old t-shirt inside out. That's for you, Ethan. That's for you, Ethan. Let's talk grouper. Let's talk anchoring versus drifting. I love that we just got the tables turned on us, but I'm also excited to talk about grouper. Drifting versus anchoring, pros and cons. What do you got? How do you approach this topic? Uh, I would say the biggest mistake the typical angler makes is they go bottom fishing and they're trying to catch grouper and they do not anchor up. They just drift. And then they don't understand why they don't catch grouper. And why is that a problem? Well, you'll catch very few grouper drifting. They like to stare at your bait for a while before they decide if they're going to eat it. And in many cases, they have to be kind of drawn out of their hiding places to kind of come over and see what the commotion is. So um, there are exceptions, of course. I mean, if they're feeding very actively and you're drifting, you can get lucky and catch a couple grouper here and there. If you're out in the break... um, 200 feet of water, 250 feet of water, drifting with a a vertical jig, you can certainly get some grouper there. They they can feed a bit more aggressively in that scenario. But day in, day out, 25 miles and 100 foot of water, if you're drifting, uh, you'll catch bottom fish, but you're just not going to catch very many grouper. You, You really need to be stationary, anchored up on top of them, or if you have one of the newer... Uh, GPS spot lock trolling motors, those are those work great as well. But you need to be stationary in an area. Um, can't tell you how many times I get to a spot and I'm sitting exactly where I want to be sitting on anchor. The sonar's lit up. I've got the right marks down there, and I drop down. It's very rare that I would catch a grouper right away. Um, either they're not there. Or and, and, and they'll later come over when we start catching the sea bass and the grunts and the bee liners and everything else that's there and, and they hear and feel the commotion. Or they're there and they're just being stubborn and kind of laying around staring at your bait. And um, most typically, you know, we start to get grouper bites after we've been out of spot 10 minutes, 15 minutes. You know, it takes a little bit to kind of uh, draw them in and get them in a feeding mode. So... So I like that. So the drifting is problematic. And so the anchoring and over a course of a day of grouper fishing, are you dropping that anchor a handful of times or is it usually drop it once and then maybe just adjust a couple of times? Um, I drop that anchor to start the day and then I just fly it or drag it behind me from spot A to spot B all day long. And then I haul it in at the end. I I mean, I might... On a typical day, I'm going to hit 20, maybe 25 spots. Okay. Um, and I'm just dragging the anchor, you know, behind me from spot to spot to spot. How long I spend in a given area just kind of depends on what I'm catching, what's, you know, what's coming over the gunnels, so to speak, what's going in the fish box, what I see on the sonar. Um, you know, it's a little bit of um, sometimes we spend just a few minutes at a spot because, um the sonar isn't looking so good once we settle out on anchor. Some of the fish moved away and nothing big's coming over the side. Uh, other times we might be there 10, 15, 20 minutes, and I'm convinced there are a grouper down there. They just need more time to get fired up and decide to bite. So I, I, I want to ask this question so I don't forget it. I don't know if I'm going out of order and what we sort of ah, assume. So, like, 
if in a typical drop, like the first 10, 5, 15 minutes is really about getting the grouper excited and it's more, you know, getting the other fish around, biting, feeding, does that affect what you drop? Are you dropping smaller baits to begin with and, and not bombing big baits right off the bat? Or no, you're bombing right off the bat. I'm bombing big baits right off the bat. Um, you know, it, sometimes I'll have one person. I typically fish four people on the boat. And sometimes I'll have one person on the bow work a chicken rig, you know, typical high, low rig, whatever you want to call it with small baits like squid squares or, you know, squid wing cut up into squares about the size of your thumbnail. And, you know, that can kind of help if, especially if they're a trigger fish around because their mouths are so small and that way you get them as a bycatch. But by and large, I want to fire down big baits, you know, whole cigar minnows, whole Spanish sardines, whole Boston mackerel, um, maybe half a Boston mackerel if it's a really big one. But I want big baits going down there because the grouper don't eat that little small thumbnail size squid square very often. Um, you'll certainly get a, a red grouper that'll do it every now and then. They're, they're not that particular, but you're not getting a gag or a scamp on a squid square very often. So drop big whole baits down there and the little fish, they might peck it to pieces and you might get frustrated because you drop five baits in a row and you didn't catch anything. The little fish are just pecking it, pecking it, pecking it. Um, that's part of the process, you know, that commotion, they're creating all sorts of vibration in the water that, uh, will certainly be felt, um, by the grouper, even if they're not right there. Um, and then they get the scent going in the water because they've got small mouths. They have to peck at that and they don't, you know, they're messy eaters. They get little chunks floating in the water and that scent draws the grouper in. So, um, I don't want to give them a small bait, like a, a, again, a squid square, because now these little bycatch pecker fish can just slurp it in whole and it kind of, they're not chumming it up down there, so to speak. Oh, that makes sense. I mean, that makes sense. So it's just a matter of telling your clients or people fish on your boat, don't get frustrated about losing baits. Yeah. You know, that's, that's part of the process. It's one of the big mistakes people make, honestly, is, you know, they, they bring, you know, uh, one box of s cigar minnows and then they cut it, they cut each cigar minnow up into four pieces, <laughs> you know, it's, no, don't do it that way. Whole bait, big bait every time. Well, let's, I'm going for, I'm going back to our list now, w where to fish. Now you're fishing out of Hampstead. So we're going to talk more specifically about that, but I'm guessing the conversation will give some application if you're fishing out of different inlets. Oh, absolutely. I mean, for somebody just starting out where to fish, I would say the easiest thing would be to say, go to at least 80 foot of water, um, for gag grouper, just on average, you can certainly get them shallower than that, uh, especially in the fall, but you know, typically, you know, May through, uh, the end of the season, May one through, uh, New Year's Eve, I would say 80 foot, you know, is a good starting point. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily go that deep for gag grouper in the late fall, but, for someone just starting out, look at bottom structure on a published chart, so to speak. Um, areas nearby in Onslow Bay would be things like 23 Mile Rock, uh, the 200-200. Um, you know, some of the uh, reefs, uh, the WR4, you know, things like that. And the big thing would be you might have a number and you put, type it in your GPS, you drive to the area, that's by no means the only place you should be considering fishing. And, and frankly, it's probably the, the least likely place you should be considering fishing because everybody knows about it. The best thing you can do is drive around for an hour, you know, troll, put out something for King Mackerel or whatever you want. But, um, the, you know, you're just doing that to wet a line. You're, what you're really doing is driving around for an hour, watching the bottom the whole time. And every time you see a little hump, ledge, uh, hard bottom fish holding to the hard bottom, etc. You should be creating waypoints and you know building up your database of places to fish. And you know if you were to look at um, a, a published map of 23 Mile Rock or the Nashville or some of these other more common areas, you might have two or three numbers in that area that are listed on that map. Uh, if you look at my GPS machine for that same area, I'm going to have 50, 60, maybe a hundred numbers. Cause I've driven all around and mapped every nook and cranny off the beaten path, so to speak. So what exactly am I looking for on my sonar? Like 
and what I've heard from others is, is we're not looking for a big relief. We're not looking for a big ledge that often it's the smaller that I guess isn't targeted that much. Or So I follow the philosophy maybe a little bit more on what I'm looking for as I'm cruising around looking for new waypoints. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So as you're cruising around looking for new waypoints, obviously, you know, relief, uh, you know, ledges, uh, areas where it goes from 90 foot to 100 foot, you know, those are big dramatic areas. Uh, I definitely like the smaller relief areas better. They're, you know, a lot of people pass right over that. It doesn't get hit as hard. Um, you know, it might go from 90 feet to 93 feet. So if you know you need to have your uh, bottom machine set where you're focused, you're zoomed in on the bottom. Um, a split screen, you know, on my Garmin is 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 how I do it. Um, and then the other thing would be you don't always have to have a ledge or you know any sort of relief. I mean, it can just be hard bottom. Some of my most productive spots are just hard bottom. There's not a you know, obvious drop off or ledge or height difference, but I've got fish holding tight to that hard bottom. Um, it's, it's almost like a English muffin, you know, it's little nooks and crannies down there. So the overall heights, their depth is the same, but there is some, uh, little, you know, small pockets here and there for the, you know, grouper to root around in. So that's what I'm looking for on the sonar is almost like your analogy an English muffin bottom. Yeah. So I'll be able to see smooth sand will be pretty obvious, but then that hard bottom you think will be just as obvious if I'm zoomed in on if, the bottom. If, if you know what to look for and, and you know, unfortunately a lot of people don't adjust their sonar. And so, you know, they turn it on and then they just go. Um, one of the best things you can do is adjust the range on your sonar so that rather than let's say you're in a hundred foot of water, you know, if you leave it on, auto your your sonar is going to shoot to maybe 110 feet okay if you take it off of auto and adjust it to 140 feet now you're shooting further down and you'll be able to see what's hard bottom and what isn't because hard bottom will look like um basically stalactites from the top of a cave you'll see these tall spikes extending downward and just being able to differentiate between hard bottom and sand or soft bottoms, uh, un, you know, a very important thing. And unfortunately, a lot of anglers can't do that. So they pass right over hard bottom spots. So set the sonar to look 30, 40 feet beyond the yeah. depth of water you're in. Absolutely. And then you're going to get much more detailed view of the bottom to help you determine what you're looking at. Absolutely. And it's going to take practice to figure out what you're looking at, but at least yep. adjusting the sonar gets you better in the game. Absolutely. Then what about the difference between spotting fish, spotting bait, and spotting hard bottom? I guess since we're talking about reading yeah. the sonar now, right? help me out. You know, it's hard. Sometimes, um, the, obviously, the greatest thing is when you have good structure. You know, you've got a ledge and you've got fish associated with that. That gives you your highest degree of confidence. Other times you might just see the fish, but not really know what they're, why they're there. And you know, if, if I see that and it's over sand, I just keep going. Cause that's bait. If I see it and it's over hard bottom, then I'm very well might fish it. One of the biggest things I look for is the kind of size and color intensity of the fish that are marking up on the sonar. Um, if it's a hundred feet deep and you've got this big red blob that comes 30 feet off the bottom, that's going to be small fish. You know, that's going to be bait and small fish mixed okay. together. You might have some grouper in there, but you're not going to have too many. You know, I, I really, you know, the bigger fish don't need to school, so to speak. So, you know, if you're, hitting these really big obvious christmas tree blow up marks every time and you're not catching grouper a big part of it is because you're not fishing the right marks you need to be looking for the smaller marks that maybe only come 10 feet off the bottom and especially if it's all packed really tightly together um, in those cases you're going to have bigger fish um, even your bycatch rather than you know catching 11 inch sea bass your bycatch is 16 inch sea bass type thing so a Big, let me make sure I'm following. So a big mark over top of the right bottom is still worthy of dropping a line down. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, if you've got a if you've got a beautiful ledge and you've got a big mark there, absolutely, drop it down. You're going to have you know the potential for some nice fish. 
But if you've been there five, 10 minutes and you keep pulling up 11 inch sea bass, it's time to go. Okay. Cause you're just going to keep pulling up 11 inch sea bass. Now I am often amazed at the talent with which the captains I fish with can read their electronics. Are you able to look at the electronics and say, that's probably a grouper? I do not feel I can ever look at a red blob on my screen and tell you what kind of fish it is. <laughs> All right. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, yeah, like amberjack tend to look one way, triggerfish tend to look another. But when it comes to grouper, I can't look at the massive fish down there and say, oh, one, two, three, four. Okay, there are four grouper down there. Um, I know some people who are convinced they can. I don't have that skill set. What I can do is oftentimes see a really nice mark down there and say to myself, okay, that looks really good. There are going to, there's either going to be some grouper there, or this is going to be uh, some really nice bycatch for the fish box. What do the uh, amber jacks tend to look like? Usually kind of squiggly lines uh, up above everything else, you know, 20 feet off the bottom. Okay. Um, I'm going from our notes here, rigs and bait. Rigs and bait. Um, we touched on bait a little bit. Um, I'm not a big fan of small baits. I'm not a big fan of squid in general, especially squid squares. Um, I want big baits. I like whole cigar minnows, whole Spanish sardines, Boston mackerel. Some, sometimes I fish them whole. Sometimes I'll cut them in half, um, just depending on how big it is. But, you know, roughly speaking, you want a bait that's you know, I don't know, about the size of a hot dog, you know, five, six inches long, um, you know, something pretty sizable. And um, I definitely use live bait, you know, live pinfish in particular. I'll always head offshore with a live well full of pinfish. What I don't want to do is just drop pinfish down at every every stop because partly you'll waste your pinfish and then on amberjack because uh, they like a live bait much more than they like a dead bait. And then when you finally get a good spot with some, you know, good grouper bite going and you want to fire down some pinfish to try to get the bigger scamps that are down there or the bigger gags that are down there, you're out of them. So I, I tend to use them kind of judiciously. I, I really like to use the dead bait at a spot for a solid five, 10 minutes, stir things up, get some scent in the water. And then if I really think they're a grouper there, but we haven't caught any, Sure. Let's drop a pinfish down before we consider moving somewhere else and, and see what happens. So with the uh, with the Boston Spanish cigar minnows, are you heading out with that variety with every trip or so you like having options mm -hmm. every time you're out there? Yeah. And another one I didn't mention is just Menhaden, just flats of Menhaden from, you know, fish house or seafood market. Um, I like to have the variety. I have had trips where. They really wanted Boston mackerel and nothing else. And I've had other trips where they really wanted Menhaden and nothing else. And I'm kind of cycling through the baits. Um, oftentimes, you know, just kind of a little trial and error for that day to see what, what seems to be working best. Squid? You got squid on the boat? I, I haven't brought squid on the boat in years. <laughs> Uh, I mean, other than squid squares, which I bring for trigger fish, you know, yeah. uh, or if I've got kids that want to catch bee liners or, you know, work a chicken rod, you know, that sort of thing. What about the rig? The rig. Um, I really try to keep it simple. Um, I like just what would be a classic, you know, three way rig with a, um, you know, 130 pound mon mono leader uh, coming off of my braid to just provide a little bit of stretch there because I'm fishing a really tight drag and I don't want to pull hooks. So I need to have just a little bit of stretch. And then it goes to a, a combi swivel, which would be like, you know, kind of like two barrel swivels intersected, or you could use a three-way swivel if you wanted to. And basically your leader goes to one of the, you know, points on the three-way. On the other opposite, it you have a small dropper loop of 60 or 80 pound mono for your bank sinker. And you want that to be a lighter line. So if that bank sinker gets stuck in one of the nooks and crannies of that English muffin bottom, it can break off and you save the rest of your rig. Uh, and then going to the hook, I like just a short piece of fluorocarbon. Um, I use 130 pound fluorocarbon and I just use two feet of it. Um, plenty of people use longer sections, maybe four, six feet, but the problem there is you have a harder time feeling the bite. There's a bigger distance between the hook and the next piece of metal, which is going to be your three-way swivel. And so 
your less experienced anglers don't feel the bite nearly as well that way. And also with a longer leader, you have to let the whole contraption down a little more slowly so it doesn't tangle. For me, it's just easier to keep it at two feet. They can feel it better. I don't think the grouper in this area are leader shy or tackle shy very often, so it doesn't really seem to make a difference in catch rate. Hook, what about what hook are we tying on? I really like an 8 hook um, because it's big enough and strong enough to handle the grouper, but it is also small enough for the bycatch. So a nice sea bass, you'll catch them on an 8 hook. You know, a nice beeliner, uh, even triggerfish, which have really small mouths, you'll catch on an 8 hook on occasion. Um, one thing I'm adamant about is I really like stout hooks. I, I really like 3, 4X, you know, diameter hooks. I've had, unfortunately, too many people hook into very nice grouper and their hook straightens or breaks. And one of the biggest reasons for that is it's just, uh, you know, kind of a standard issue hook. It's not super duty, uh, beefed up, you know, three or four X diameter hook. Are you uh, snelling the hook or? You know, I, I tend to snell it. And personally, I, I think it I think it helps a little more with the hookup ratio, but that's kind of a, a soft finding, so to speak. You know, that's not that's not cast in stone. I think the biggest thing I would stress about the rig is however you decide you're going to do it, do it right. Okay. I mean, you're, you're, these fish are incredibly strong, incredibly strong. And you're fishing with lots of drag, 30 pounds or more. And there's not a lot of give. And, you know, like if they're stripping line off, they're going to get you in the rocks. And so it's a giant tug of war and something's going to fail and you want it to be the grouper that fails and you want them to come over, over the gunnels and into the ice bath. But if your knot isn't tight, if your crimp isn't done properly, if you've got a hook that, you know, isn't stout enough or your braid isn't stout enough, I mean, you need to make sure everything is right. And, uh, I really, you know, I spend the off season tying rigs, you know, boxes and boxes of rigs, you know, and I'm meticulous about it because if I try to tie a rig out on the boat with slimy hands in a hurry and the waves are going, I'm not going to do it nearly as well as I can do it sitting at my fishing bench in the off season. And for, you know, uh, all the anglers out there, I mean, I don't know what you do on your windy days, but on my windy days, I'm, I'm making rigs, you know, like when you get broke off offshore, you should be grabbing a new rig that's already pre-tied, not spending 15 minutes going through your tackle box, trying to find all the components. And then you kind of do a crummy job of, uh, or less than ideal job of tying it because you're in a hurry out there. Man, uh, I, I caught this name. Maybe I caught it right. Maybe I didn't, but I want to ask this question. I think you called it a combi swivel. Combi swivel. So what is the advantage? I use those. I was told to use those. What is the advantage of a combi swivel over just a standard three-way swivel? Um, a, a combi swivel is, um, it's just, it's a little smaller profile. Um, I think they just, um, the, another nice advantage of it is they don't tangle as much. Um, basically you've got what would look like two barrel swivels kind of at a 90 degree angle to each other. And the bit that goes to your hook that has your bait on it can spin a lot more freely. And especially if you have a live bait, your live bait can swim a lot more freely without tangling things up. Okay. I, I, ha I have not had a combi swivel fail, but I've certainly had three way swivels, uh, fail on nice fish. And while I'm on that, it just made me think of it. Don't use snap swivels. Um, people, you know, your, your braid going to your 130 pound mono, uh, should be tied directly to your three way swivel. Don't use a snap swivel there. Those snap swivels fail. Okay. Um, even if they're big ones, um, what I have a good friend, I make fun of for this cause he's like, well, <laughs> I catch big Wahoo on snap swivels. Why do I, you know, why can't I use one on a grouper? That's, you know, 15 pounds when I can catch a 80 pound Wahoo on it. Well, you know, when you catch that 80 pound Wahoo, he, you hear the drag go off. Zzz, that doesn't happen when you're grouper fishing. And so, you know, under that high stress environment, uh, high drag, tons of pressure on it. That snap swivel will bust. Give me a little bit on rod and reel. Rod and reel. Um, I'm a big fan of conventional reels. Um, some people like spinners. That's fine. The problem with the spinner is when you hook something big, 
the spinning reel just doesn't have the torque where you can just turn the handle on the reel. So you have to be pumping with the rod and, you know, up and down. We're all familiar with that up and down pumping motion. Um, it's hard to do that with a big grouper on the other end. And even if you can muscle them that way and kind of muscle them out of their hole and you're muscling them all the way up to the surface, every time you dip that rod to retrieve line, you're, you got the potential of creating slack. And I definitely have my share of grouper that hit the boat. And as soon as they hit the gunnel or the deck, rather, the hook comes out, you know, and if the angler was pumping up and down, well, that's one of the reasons they get off on the way up. So I'm a much bigger fan of conventional reels than I am spinning reels. And I really like, you know, conventional reels that have two speeds, because when you hook something big, being able to pop it into low gear, it's like four wheel drive. You know, we're all familiar with, you know, winching our boats up on the trailer. Well, next time you go to do that, uh, most of your boat winches have two speeds. <laughs> Take it out of low gear and try and try winching your boat on the trailer and tell me how easy that is. Um, Billy doesn't. I don't have any experience. He doesn't have a boat. <laughs> I don't have a boat, which I'm surprised. I don't think nope, he plugged I, that I, at I the was, beginning of this podcast. I, I made anyone want to give me a boat because I, I'm doing a podcast. I made effort not to do that, <laughs> but I'm still looking for a, a boat sponsor. <laughs> well, one day you'll know. You one day you'll know what Todd and I are talking about when we talk <laughs> yeah. about winching up a boat. Yeah, one day. One day. I'm not gonna hold my breath. Um, what about rod? Um, I really, you know, I really like a short rod. Um, and you know, short and stout, basically, uh, I, I use a, a rod barely over five foot, five foot two extra heavy. Um, if you think about it, if you are trying to lift something heavy, like a bucket full of water, and you're going to have a much easier time lifting it with a five foot pole than a 10 foot pole, because you know, the fulcrum, you know, the, you know, the pressure point is going to be much closer to you with that shorter pole. Um, same thing here, you know, so I, I like a, I like a short rod and you've probably already said it. Um, the, you like what kind of braid, what size braid? Uh, I, actually it's a good point. I didn't say it. I, I use a hundred pound braid. Um, I, you can get away with 80 pound braid if it's really good quality, but I, unfortunately I've seen a lot of 80 pound, 80 pound braid pop and just break off on nice fish. And so, um, I really, it seems to me that the woven hollow braids are a bit stronger maybe than the solid ones, just kind of my observations o over the years. Um, you don't need a lot of line capacity on your reel to grouper fish. I mean, you know, we're typically doing this less than 150 foot of water. So it's get 130 pound or 150 pound if you want. Um, you know, you can't hold nearly as much line on, on, on your spool that way, but it doesn't really matter because, you know, really all you need is about 200 foot of good quality braid. I mean, you know, thin diameter so that when there's a lot of current, it's not getting swept away, et cetera. But the, the diameter difference from say 130 pound braid to 80 pound braid is minimal. So for a lot of people, I would say they'd be better off just getting 130 pound braid. Um, I'm excited to talk about the next topic, which we have listed as how to feel the bite. <laughs> and I yeah. think many people who want to be a better grouper angler are thinking, help me out with feeling yeah. the bite. So I, one of the biggest misconceptions I run across is people confuse what the bite feels like with how the fight, how the fish fights. Okay. Okay. Grouper fight incredibly hard and every now and then they will absolutely annihilate your bait with a very aggressive bite. Um, but the, the, that's rare. Um, it's usually a very soft bite. Uh, the analogy I use, I think a lot of anglers out there have done some largemouth bass fishing. Okay? okay. So if you're largemouth bass fishing and you're using a spinner bait or a buzz bait and you're just cranking it along, you're going to get a violent strike. Okay. That is totally different from the bite you're going to get when you're creeping a rubber worm along the bottom. And the majority of grouper bites are that soft. I'm creeping a rubber worm along the bottom and the fish just sucks it in and they have huge mouths. They open it up. It's just a huge bucket. It's nothing for them to suck in that five, six inch bait. And so it's just a little thump or a tap and people all the time, you know, ignore it. I'm like real. 
You know, I tell my clients all the time, real, you just got bit. And, you know, they look at me like I'm crazy. And then, you know, they reel and, and all of a sudden the pole doubles over and they're, well, how did you know that? Well, I saw, I saw your line. I saw your rod tip. Um, so if you think that, okay, grouper bite hard and I haven't had a good grouper bite all day, etc., that's just not the case. They bite soft most of the time. They suck in that bait. They hold it in their mouth. And if you don't realize it sometimes they feel the hook and they just spit it back out um i had a group the other week recently that ended up catching three nice grouper when i cranked up the motors and said okay it's time to go to the next spot and they started to reel it up and there were grouper on the other end and they just didn't realize it the fish had sucked in their bait and was just sitting there still so help me out help our viewers listeners out the tap tap of the small fish versus the soft bite of a grouper it's hard i mean you know if if it's really rapid uh, uh morse code type tap 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 yeah that's a little small pecker fish you know it's just pecking away at it so to speak and you can ignore that or you can just kind of reel it up and if there isn't a fish there uh and your rod doesn't double over you know let it back down um if after a while that pecking stops, they got your bait, you need to, you know, bring it up. Um, it, it can be hard for people to differentiate between the two. I tend to just tell people until you know better, just reel. Uh, because if you're not sure if that tap, tap, tap that you're feeling is a pecker fish or a grouper, what do you got to lose? Just reel. See if there's a fish there. And you'd be surprised because plenty of times you think, okay, this is nothing. And you reel and all of a sudden there's something with shoulders on the other end. And I think you're being very specific with your wording. We are not setting a hook. We are reeling. Oh, please don't set the hook. Please don't set the hook. Yeah. I mean, first of all, we should all be using circle hooks on these fish. And if you go pulling up, you're not going to engage that hook properly. The circle hooks work best by reeling. Even if you're, you know, a scofflaw and you're using a J hook, you're way better off just reeling with a J hook than you are pulling up and setting the hook. For a couple of reasons. One, when you pull up with that J hook, if you do it quickly enough and lodge the, the barb of that hook in the roof of that grouper's mouth, the hook's probably going to break during the fight because it's got no wiggle room. And as every time the grouper dives to the bottom, it's putting all the pressure on the bend of that J hook. And I've got a collection of broken hooks from people that have done that. The other bad thing is if you do pull up and hook into that fish, now you're stuck with the rod up high and there's no good way to recover from that scenario. The only thing you can do is drop the rod and re you know, put the rod tip down and reel. And when you do that, the grouper is going to gain ground. So, um, the best thing you can do is just hold onto the rod and reel. Hold it straight out. I mean, is that usually parallel or? Hold it parallel to the water and start reeling. And if it's a big fish, that big fish is going to bow that rod tip into the water. The, the biggest fish I catch, I catch with the rod probably at like a 30 degree angle. I mean, the tip is in the water. It's the fish is practically pulling me in because you know, they're big, strong fish and I'm not trying to lift them up with the rod. I'm not that strong of a guy. And, and even the big, strong guys that come on the boat, aren't that strong, get it in low gear. And now all you gotta do is hold onto the rod and you just turn in the handle on an easy winch just like you know you can't winch that boat on the trailer in high gear very well and you can't lift the boat on the trailer but if you get it in low gear one little increment at a time you can get the job done i follow that analogy I th that works well I, I wonder if i spent enough time on the bite though like just thinking about that like i think about the mind games i'm playing with myself when i'm out there like all right, I've gotten some pecs. Am I sure I, the pecs have stopped? Is that automatic check the bait or is mm -hmm. that, I mean, I've been told maybe something big's moved in and chased the little fish away. Is that a misnomer? Is that? Um, I'd say anytime that you've had a few things pecking at your bait and the pecs have stopped, give it 20, 30 seconds, then you need to be reeling it up because you're not going to catch anything with an empty hook and more often than not, you're fishing on credit. What about, I mean, I'm, I still experience, I mean, I, I don't have a big bottom fishing resume, but I'll drop that bait down and it'll be a little while. I haven't felt a thing. And then I reel up and check and I've lost my bait. That's where I get the most frustrated. If I, you know, if I'm having pecs or if I miss a bite, okay. But when I feel nothing and bring back that empty hook. 
it happens. It happens to all of us. And, um, you know, part of it is some of those little fish down there are just great little bait stealers. Um, uh, the other part of it is, um, just a little bit of technique, you know, like always keep your thumb or some finger on the braid so you can, you know, feel it. And, you know, keep in mind, you're, you're trying to interpret what's going on a hundred feet away or 130 feet away. And so, um, you might feel the slightest little thing, but what's actually going on down there is quite violent. Um, if you ever drop a camera down, an action camera, a GoPro or a Garmin Verb or whatever your brand of choice is, you'd be amazed what you see going on down there. I mean, I've dropped them down numerous times with people fishing and, um, you know, their baits getting tore all up and they're just sitting there oblivious that they're even getting a bite. Is there a way I can hook the bait to keep the bait on the hook longer? How about that? How, or a, I should just no, say, how do you hook the bait? Yeah, no, that's a that's an excellent question. Um, I hook it just one single time. I want the hook exposed. Um, I'm not trying to keep the bait on there longer. It's part of the process. You know, these little fish are going to tear up the bait. You're going to go through some bait. Bring, you know, I, I tend to bring, I don't know, maybe 10 pounds of bait per person for a trip at hook, least. Hooking through the eyes, yeah. hooking through the back. I, I hook them one time just sideways through the eyes because uh, it's quick and easy and lots of barb is exposed to sink in the fish's mouth. But if you want to take more time and do it through the nose or, you know, from, from the chin up through the nose, you could. If you get frustrated and want to try hooking it through the tail for a change of pace, you can. But, you know, 90% of the time, just a quick swipe sideways through the eyes, get that bait down there. But yeah, just, just one time, don't try to thread it back through and hide the barb in, in it. Don't try to hide the hook in the bait. Um, you want the hook exposed. What about more than one type of bait on the same hook? You can do that. If you want to give them a smorgasbord, go for it. You know, um, you know, you give them a cigar minnow and a menhaden or you take a squid and stuff a cigar minnow up inside it or whatever. You can totally do that. I don't know that it really makes a difference, to be honest with you. I think it is just something we like to do when we're getting frustrated and we're trying to come up with creative games to not be bored out there. So, I mean, talking about getting frustrated, I, I, you've covered a lot of this, but you got clients on the boat that aren't that well-versed in grouper. What is sort of like the main mistakes you see or the main way you help them overcome them for success? Well, th the main thing for, for them is, um, you know, just helping them feel the bite and, and, you know, catching bycatch, so to speak, you know, if they're, if they're getting sea bass and grunts and, uh, bee liners and other keepers, you know, red porgy, et cetera, then, you know, they're happy, you know, they're not bored. Fish are going in the box, et cetera. But ultimately the reason they're coming is they want to catch grouper. And I mean, it would be very rare that we would go out and not catch a couple grouper, um, you know, I, I want everybody to catch them, but I mean, I'll be honest, some people just can't get the hang of it. Um, and I unfortunately have trips where, you know, we might have landed two or three grouper and lost six or seven to the rocks because they, you know, didn't feel the bite quickly enough and the grouper already had a head start getting them into the rocks before they realized what was going on. Or they just couldn't budge the grouper and they couldn't get the reel into low gear quickly enough to kind of reverse course, that sort of thing. So that's something else. I mean, that could have made my things you hear on a boat when you're grouper fishing. So if let's say I, you took Billy and I fishing and then Billy, of course, broke off a grouper in the rocks. Is that going to mess the bite up? Should we pull up and move? Um, I wouldn't pull up and move Im immediately, but it often does mess the bite up. It depends on how fired up they are. You know, sometimes you break a fish off in the rocks and, um, they're just feeding so aggressively. It doesn't matter. Other times you break one off in the rocks and it, it, it shuts down pretty quickly. So typically if someone breaks, breaks one off in the rocks, I kind of make a mental note of the time and let's say five, 10 minutes go by and no one's doing anything. We get out of there. Now I might come back to that spot later in the day and, and try it again, but I'm going to get out of there for the time being. And how long are you going to target a spot before getting a, with no group or bites before you move on? Boy, that's a really good question. Um, it, 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 it honestly depends on what else we're catching. Two things. What does the sonar look like and what else are we catching? 
if I'm at a spot and the sonar looks great, I've got this really beautiful red mark tight to the bottom, and I've got a, a, a high degree of confidence that they're going to be grouper around, I'm going to give it a longer period of time. Um, if we're catching good quality bycatch, I'm going to give it a longer period of time. And what I mean by that is if you're catching 16 and 17 inch sea bass, 18 inch sea bass, you're more likely to have grouper around. If you're catching grunts, well, if, you know, if they're little, little small ones that are about the size of your hand, that's nothing impressive. But if you're getting big ones where you're like, oh, you know, that's worth throwing in the box and making some fish tacos out of, you know, that's a good bycatch, you know, fish tend to hang out by size class. And so if your bycatch is of impressive quality, you're more likely to have grouper around. Um, ultimately, you know, if I'm at a spot and it's been five, 10 minutes and we don't have anything for the fish box, I'm, I'm out of there unless the sonar just looks beautiful. And I think something else is going on. Um, if we're getting nice bycatch in the fish box and it's been 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and we have no grouper bites, I'm probably going to try that live pin fish or maybe a piece of cut bait or something they haven't seen yet to see if I can tempt them into eating. But I'm not staying anywhere more than 20 minutes if we're not catching grouper. So what would be the, uh, the primary cohabitator of the grouper? Like what quality bycatch would you most like to see to give you the promise that there's grouper sea bass or grunts or something else it, it depends on what depth i'm at so you know if i'm fishing in 85 foot of water for gags and i'm catching 15 16 inch sea bass i'm pretty happy about that uh, i'm pretty confident there are going to be some gags around if i'm catching uh those big big grunts that are um you know worthy of making tacos out of i'm pretty happy there are going to be some grouper around if I'm getting ringtails and lizard fish and sand perch and the other undesirables, I'm out of there. Okay. Man, I mean, we've covered a whole lot of ground. Like, I, I love talking grouper. And I think this is the point where I say, is there something that still yet to be said that I haven't set you up with a question, something you had in your mind might be good for people to hear that I just haven't given you the opportunity to talk about yet? You know, the only thing I could think of would be you brought up what to do if you break a fish off in the rocks. I guess one thing would be what do you do when you get rocked and you, you're not broke up, bro Great. broken off yet. Great. So, you know, the first thing I always have to figure out is was there really a fish or did someone just snag bottom right. and, you know, they think it's a fish. Um, but in the cases where... How do you determine that? Well... If I'm the one fishing, <laughs> I've got a pretty good idea. Or if it's one of my, you know, buddies that I fish with a good bit, I, I kind of know, uh, you know, how trustworthy and reliable they are. Um, otherwise, I just kind of have to ask the angler, you know, did you really, you know, talk to me about this? I didn't see it happen, you know. And usually they, usually they, they'll figure out, okay, yeah, I, I definitely had a fish. I had three or four cranks on him, and then okay. he pinned me down type thing. Okay. Um, but, you know, bottom line is if, if, if you're caught up in the rocks, um, one of the worst things you can do is just uh, crank tight on it and break the line off because you can get those fish out of the rocks sometimes. Um, I like to crank down as tight as I can, absolutely as tight as I can, and then just start plucking the braid like a banjo. And I have no musical talent whatsoever, so it's really annoying to the fish down there because I have no rhythm. So absolutely, <laughs> it, it irritates them. Um, but it, the vibrations are, the, irritates their lateral line. And I, I've had a, a, quite a few groupers just swim out of their hiding place. You know, they, they get in a rock and they flare those gills out, you know, their gill plates, and they lodge themselves in there. And they don't want to come out. And you're trying to, you know, pulling them out is kind of like trying to pull an arrowhead out backwards. It's just not meant to happen. So, um, try to get them to come out on their own, really pluck the, the braid and the braids better than the mono for that. And, and get, you know, do that until, you know, you're really annoyed and you, you know, your fingers are hurting and so forth. And if they still haven't swum out, then I like to just put it in the rod holder and give it total 100% slack, no pressure whatsoever and give it a good 10, 15 minutes. I mean, don't touch it. Just okay. have the angler sit there with a, a soda and a snack and watch that line. And because the fish is going to swim out eventually. It's just a matter of, you know, are you going to be ready to move to the next spot before that happens? So um, you see that line moving, you start cranking. Um, you know, I'd say about half the time we can get them out. 
Uh, the other half the time they don't come out and I'm ready to move and I just pull. And every now and then I, I pull that arrowhead out backwards and actually get the fish out. But more often than not, when I'm pulling, I'm going to break it off. Man, uh, Todd, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation of summertime grouper. I'm already in my head thinking, <laughs> bring you back in the fall to talk about maybe scamps, to talk about reds, to, sure. to be expand. We just don't have time tonight. But this has been fantastic. Now, this is typically the part of the show where I say, hey, Captain, give me the highlight of what are the different species you target throughout the year? I mean, that's normally the question I ask right now. So from January to May 1st, you're tying rigs. In the spring, yeah. you're targeting grouper. Uh, once May 1 hits, I'm targeting grouper. So in the summertime? Grouper. And then when the fall comes? Grouper. Up until January 1st? Grouper. All right. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> clear. That's pretty easy. <laughs> I got a one track mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's clear. Um, Todd, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it Already awesome. looking thank forward you. to next time. Billy. Man, what a good show, Gary. What a good show. I don't even I'm trying to pull up a camera shot here. I'm all out of whack. Oh wait, I'm gonna look here. <laughs> yeah. Come on, Gary, look at your camera. All right, here we go. What are we doing? Best takeaway? Billy's best takeaway. Oh man, there this you is are. my best takeaway. Here we go, here we go. I'm just getting all this stuff. Two things. One thing I really... Two things. This two is things. a first, Captain oh. Todd. What I really loved about what Captain Todd said, I can tell he's this person, is if you're going to do something, do it well. And I, I really like that because I did go fishing with a captain one time and it, I know he wasn't tying those hooks at, sitting at his workbench. Like he, he was tying right, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so it's frustrating, you know, whatever. So I love that. Like if you're going to do something, decide on it and do it well. And then uh, the, one of the last things he said about pl like plucking that string, man, that's cool. Like that's a cool, uh, like grouper fishing there in the hole, tighten down and pluck that thing. And it helps to not be musically inclined. Which I am, so I could probably pull every grouper so you're out letting of the me hole. Pluck. You are no, you don't want to be musically inclined. <laughs> no, maybe they would appreciate it. And you come let up me faster. pluck the line. They, they would appreciate it and be like, "Man, this guy's good." Unlike that other guy, <laughs> and then they would just come right to the boat. Hey, off air, you'll tell me the captain that I will didn't tell believe you. in doing things yeah. well. Yeah, off air, I will tell you. I want to tell you right now. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. It, Redirect, anyway, Billy. Anyway, how to watch, anyway, how to listen. Here we go. <laughs> how to watch, how to listen. Uh, Spotify, Podbean, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and Google Play. And once again, those are all listed on our website, fishermanspost.com. Go to the podcast section. And it's really important, Gary, that people um, like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, that is going to be like the... The best way for, one, for them to get updates, and then, two, for the algorithms to say, hey, these guys are producing great content. We want to share it with other people. So if you guys could like and share and um, you know subscribe, that, that helps us out a ton. So, yeah. Send absolutely. us your comments. Send us your fish photos. Send us your videos, one minute or less fish videos, please. And uh, thank you for watching. We yeah. are enjoying the podcast series. Hope you are, too. And once again, thank you, uh, Marine Warehouse, for making it all possible today. Yeah. Awesome. That's right. Fisherman